Mark, what's the public's perception of herbs and dietary supplements these days? Well, if you look at what the media is showing and mm -hmm. playing as far as print media and to some extent electronic media that follows, um, there's a very jaundiced view regarding the quality, the safety, and the benefits of herbs particularly, but dietary supplements in general. Hmm. Now, in some cases, some of this uh, negative publicity or negative associations that people might have might seem to be warranted. There are problems about quality control, there uh -huh. are problems about some safety, and there have been some problems where people have been over-promoting some of these supplements with claims that are unsubstantiated or not even able to be substantiated. At the same time, however, uh, you do have many herbal and other supplement preparations that are made by ethical companies that are mm -hmm. good quality, made by good GMP, good manufacturing mm -hmm. practices okay. as now uh, improved and mandated by the federal government, finally. Mm -hmm. uh, it took them 14 years to publish uh, the, good, the new GMP rules since the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act was passed in 1994. So it took the oh. FDA 14 years to, to get the GMPs uh, published. Uh, it took them a long time. But if you look at the newspapers, uh, particularly, and some of the other uh, public and g mainstream media, they have not kept up with the explosion in clinical research in herbs, particularly. All right. Over the last decade, we've seen hundreds of studies being published in Europe, the United States, in Asia, other parts of the world. Many, some of them turn out negative. Many of them turn out positive positive. The media tends to pick up on the negative trials more readily than they'll pick up on the positive trials, for one thing. Mm -hmm. If you look at a study that came out of Canada in 2008, they looked at newspaper articles from the England and the UK, United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, English-speaking countries. Mm -hmm. They looked at it uh, for one year, all the articles that they could find, on, and they found X number of articles on pharmaceutical drugs and X number of articles, a lower amount, on herbal preparations. Uh, it turns out that the, art, the newspapers tended to be fairly uh, negative on the herbals, uh, even when the pharmaceutical drug trials that they're mm -hmm. reporting on um, often included a significantly higher degree of adverse effects in the pharmaceutical drugs than you find in the herbal trials, uh, the herbals seem, seem, seem to get much more rigorous negative scrutiny than the mainstream medicines did. Why do you think that's so? Uh, there's a, there seems to be a bias among editors and writers in mm -hmm. the mainstream against this area. Um, herbs are considered alternative, uh, they're considered unproven, they're considered unsafe, uh, untested. Uh, in some cases, the myth of the unregulated industry still pervades oh, much, of yes. the, much of the industry or the underregulated industry. And so they just have a much higher degree of cynicism or skepticism about this area than they do with conventional pharmaceutical drugs. They are cynical about it, aren't they? They're extremely, extremely cynical. Uh, let's look at it one step further. Okay. A study done in 2008, 2008 it's called a pilot study, on 11 medical journals. Mm -hmm. The New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, The Lancet in the UK, mm -hmm. and the British Medical Journal, four out of the 11. So they were the top tier of medical journals. All right. A, a physician and a medical student reviewed uh, all of the articles over a, a one-year period in these journals. And they looked and they found the number of articles in these journals and the tone, positive, neutral, or negative, in mm -hmm. these journals, right. articles on dietary supplements and herbs, including original research and or review articles. They correlated, or they tried to see whether there was a correlation to the number of ads in each journal from pharmaceutical companies. Ah. And they found from one quarter of a page up to 60 pages of pharmaceutical ads per journal, depending on the journal. And guess what they found? What did they find? They found a direct relationship Again, this is a pilot study, so it needs to be done on a larger basis to really get the statistical significance. But what they found so far in the first 11 journals they looked at, mm -hmm. there was a definite correlation. The more pharmaceutical drug advertising found in those journals, the less number of articles that were, were published on dietary supplements, particularly herbs, mm -hmm. and the tone of those articles tended to be negative, the more of the research 
more of the, of the advertising was found in the journal, which suggests that we already know yeah. that uh, consumers are affected by advertising. We know mm -hmm. that health professionals are affected by advertising. We understand that. This is the first time that we have any evidence that suggests mm -hmm. that editors of medical journals are also affected by advertising. <laughs> or in this case, you know, the, the amount of advertising. So is it commercial or is it political? Or both? Well, is it commercial or political? I don't know that there's necessarily a distinction here. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there may be an arbitrary distinction. I don't know. All right. And I'm not imputing any nefarious intention here. Right. I'm just saying that it may be just a natural effect or mm -hmm. result that when you have large amounts of advertising from one sector, especially considering that that sector is part of the definition of mainstream medicine, that these, germ that, and that these editors in mainstream medicine are physicians in general, and they, are, they come out of the same medical education system that mm -hmm. is often largely influenced by pharmaceutical drug interests, that that has a natural or an inevitable effect on their judgment in this matter. And, I'm, and this is something that we didn't cook up, it just was published in a journal by a physician and a medical student intern. Some of the significance here is that people rely on medical journals mm. and the articles they publish and the way the media reports these articles for their information as to what works, what doesn't mm -hmm. work, what's safe, what's not safe. Not just the average consumer mm -hmm. reading this from the newspaper, but, re but physicians as well. It affects standards of practice because many physicians, admittedly, don't have time to read the medical journals themselves. So they read about some of these articles in the mainstream media, in the USA Today, in the Associated Press article. They haven't had time to go back to the journal and read it. Mm -hmm. They are just don't have the time. And they have the families, they have busy lives as well to mm -hmm. take care of and all the patient records to deal with, whatever, they, you know, dictating stuff to their assistants, etc. They they're busy. Uh, at the same time, there's also uh, the medical newsletters and you know, non-medical journal publications that also take their cue. So it affects physician perception and physician practice. And then it also affects, I think, uh, according to what I've read, the way authoritative bodies, if you will, set mm -hmm. standards of practice. If they say, you know, this particular drug or this particular substance is recognized or not recognized because of our, uh, uh, these journal articles, mm -hmm. uh, if those journal articles sometimes, especially opinion pieces and review articles, tend to be negative on dietary supplements, that can have a big impact on perception by people who set standards of practice for different professions. It can have an impact on congressional and other regulatory bodies mm -hmm. on a state or federal level. Okay. And, it can, and this kind of reinforces the already existing negative bias that exists in many ways against the herbal supplements.